Alrighty, kia ora everybody, good morning, everybody good to go? Yeah. yeah. Um, so I'm back here in the Hawke's Bay again today. Uh, it's another opportunity to touch base with our response crews on the ground uh, to see what it is that they're confronting, to make sure that they're getting all of the support from central government that they're looking for, uh, and just to make sure that we at central government have a really good understanding of exactly what's happening locally and how best we can support that effort. Uh, I want to again compliment all of the response teams on the ground who are doing an incredible job uh, in often quite difficult circumstances. Uh, and I also want to just say a very warm thank you to all of the volunteers that are on the ground helping. Um, right here, uh, we've seen a whole lot of volunteers helping to pack um, food, to pack clothes, uh, to support people who have been... Uh, ...welcomed and really appreciated. Uh, police have been doing an incredible job of working their way through the list of people who are uncontactable. So they started with well over 6,000 people on that list. They've got that down to about 150 now. Uh, and actually even more so it, when they target in on the people who... It's actually a very small number that they're now working to identify uh, or to locate or to you know get in contact with. So I want to uh, again just say that's an incredible effort by the police. Um, it is, has been tough going, it was particularly tough going when the communications were out uh, and the police have done an incredible job in, in making sure they're doing that. I said last week uh, when I was here that we've heard the concern around forestry, around forestry slash and around the impact that land use uh, can, could land use and particularly uh, forestry slash. Uh, that's going to happen over a two month period. The review will be chaired by the Honourable Hekia Parata, a minister in the last government who's also a local up here on the east coast. Um, and she'll be supported by people with local and technical expertise in the area. Uh, my colleague Stuart Nash, the Minister of Forestry is here uh, if you've got specific questions on that inquiry. But we've set a tight time frame for, for it. We want it to happen in the next couple of months so that we can capture the lessons learned as quickly as possible uh, and we can build those into our response and our recovery efforts as well. With that, I'm happy to open up for questions. Well, listen, uh, um, how does, how does going to, you've been to the local police station this morning, Yeah, so we've had a whole team of government ministers um, through the region in the last week um, and we of course have been comparing notes. So the Minister of Finance was here on Sunday and had the opportunity to speak Those who have been most affected. To, talk, to go back to the slash, you're talking about learning lessons. Um, this isn't the first time that there's been serious issues with slash. Surely we should have learned some lessons already. Well, I think the key thing is what do we do about that? And so that's what the inquiry will be very much focused on. We want to get some practical outcomes from it. Because it's an urgent situation, the slash is up against the bridges. Right now. Sure, if you that was totally unacceptable. So the forest sector between 2018 and, and now has done a lot of work in terms of retiring forestry, uh, certain forests, moving um, slash from skid sites and crow nests. Uh, but what we saw in Hale, uh, Cyclone Hale in January and obviously this one, 
is a whole lot more wood come down the beaches, come down the rivers onto the beaches. So the forestry companies need to take responsibility for that because that is totally unacceptable to the vast majority of Kiwis. What this will do is have a look at all land practices, not just forestry, but obviously uh, forestry is a very uh, visual part of what, uh, what has happened make recommendations, work with key stakeholders to see where we can get this right. And you know, we're not saying that forestry is not the answer, because I do believe that forestry is the answer. What we need to get right though is the management practices around how forestry is grown on these uh, highly erodible soils in Tairawhiti. Can you define take responsibility? That's a general term. What does that actually mean? What practical changes are you expecting? Well, I'm not going to preempt the inquiry, obviously, because we've got three experts who are going to take two months to talk to all the key stakeholders, gather the information, and find out what sort of recommendations need to be put in place. But please be assured that we heard the 10,000 residents of Tairawhiti say we need to have an inquiry into this practice, and we want to have a series of recommendations that come out of that that key stakeholders and forestry companies uh, can implement. We've heard that. We're putting this inquiry in place and out of that will come a series of recommendations that we will be very keen to implement, but I don't want to preempt what they may be at this point. Just on the forestry, okay. just forestry first, yeah. Yeah. Um, what, what exactly does it look like? Public consultation? What are we talking about here? Well, you've got three very experienced people who, are, you know, obviously, as the Prime Minister mentioned, you've got Hekia Parata, who is well networked into that community. You've got a guy called Bill Bayfield, who ran the Christchurch uh, Regional Council during the earthquake and also a couple of other regional councils, and you've got a forestry sustainability expert. What I expect they will do is talk to all the key stakeholders, analyse the data. They, as mentioned, these are experts in the RMA, the forestry and the community field. And then out of that will come a series of recommendations that as a government we will take a look at and look to put into either the natural, uh, sorry, the NESPF, which is the National Environmental Stand for Plantation Forestry, or the council can build into their plans. But again, at this point, I don't want to preempt what will come out of that. But certainly we know things have to change because slash on beaches, on rivers, on farms is unacceptable. Yes, but can you guarantee that, so obviously key stakeholders will include people totally. of the public, so you can yeah. guarantee that the people of Tairawhiti and, and this region as well will have their voice heard adequately? Look, I think that Hekia Parata will absolutely make sure that all key stakeholders have their voices heard in this inquiry. Well, speaking of Hekia Parata, she's supposed to be in the COVID uh, inquiry, so yes. how is she going to balance She's that? confident that she can manage mm -hmm. both. Really? Really? Yeah. really? Those are like, you're going to turn around this one really quickly, the COVID one's got to be done really quickly as well? well? Well, the COVID one is over a longer period of time, and the feedback that we've had from her is that she's confident that she can balance those two. And uh, look, Hekia Parata has an incredible work ethic. I can tell you as a former opposition spokesperson <laughs> who used to question her when she was a minister, uh, she works pretty hard. Prime Minister, one, yes. of the, one of the first um, comments we've got from the orchardist up Darmore Road today, for example, is um, if they, they would like you to go up and have a look. When will that happen? Uh, look, I'm, I'm, I'm intending to be here regularly, um, so uh, I, I absolutely will take up the opportunity to do that. I can't guarantee it'll happen today, but I intend to be here regularly. The second is, uh, it's, it's general, it's around support, um, particularly for some of them cash flow to get them through this, this initial painful period. Yeah. Um, what's going to be on offer? So there is support off, on offer now. It's available now. They can apply for it now through the Ministry for Primary Industries. Um, there's a formula involved. Uh, it's a transparent formula. So in the case of orchardists, it's based on uh, you know, it's a per hectare, hectare formula to assist with the clean-up effort. Um, so I'd encourage them to, to be accessing that at the moment. One of the challenges with something like a wage subsidy, for example, is that, as we know, some of these businesses are actually back up and running now, and they're looking for workers um, and so because they, they've got to get on with their harvesting. Others of them have been really affected, and a wage subsidy isn't necessarily the, the best support that they're looking for at the moment. So what we're trying to do is make sure that we're getting the support to those who need it in a form that's going to be the most useful to you. You, you, just, you, just you just missed crime on the ground earlier this week as unsubstantiated rumours. No, that's not true. That's not true. That that that, that isn't that isn't actually what I said. So let, so let me, I'm happy to repeat what I said. Can I just ask the question first? We have first-hand accounts of roading crews having firearms pointed at them. Yeah, and, and and the messaging, part of your messaging. And a direct quote was unsubstantiated. Yeah, my, my concern here is that people need to report those incidents to the police. So I've, I've heard, I've seen now some re first hand reports of that. Um, that is utterly unacceptable, and the police will take a very, very uh, stern and strict approach against that. But people need to be reporting those instances to the police. But people, but people feel as though your response earlier in the week was diminishing the issue. No, I think, well, look, what, what, so what do you say to those right at, right at the beginning, as I've said all 
week. I acknowledge that when the power is out, when the communications are out, there is a heightened degree of anxiety and any criminal offending in that time is going to be of extra concern to a local community. That's the reason that we've got 145 extra police from outside the district, in the district here at the moment, helping on the ground. And we will keep that coming as necessary. The local police commander has basically been told that whatever resources required, uh, the, the rest of the police force will make sure that that's being delivered here on the ground. So we've got those extra police staff on the ground here. Police, police will absolutely uh, be stamping down on any criminal activity that's been happening. So you've got that kind of your response. Yes. We were talking about support before. We're, we're talking to locals today who feel that the government, central and local government, is not there for them, and that a lot of the work that they're doing is actually on their own back, and they're having to go back to work and sweep, you know, they're in tears. What is the government actually doing? And what, what reassurance can you give that hard-hit areas won't be forgotten and that help is coming? Oh, this is going to be an ongoing process. Um, it's not all going to be over in a matter of weeks. It's going to take months and in some cases years before everything gets back to normal. We are in this for the long haul. We will support these communities that have been affected to get back up and running again and to try and get life back to something that looks like normal as quickly as possible. But then we will also be here for the recovery and the rebuild as well. Will the government consider putting more boots on the ground and taking up overseas offices and people to help? Communities we're talk talking to say that would make a difference. Uh, look, we'll absolutely be making sure that we get people where they are needed. Um, we've, we'll have some more announcements on that in the coming on, days. On your police briefing, um, can you give us a bit of an uh, well, the updated number? So you mentioned the, the very small number of uh, grave concerns, probably the, the way that it's being characterised at the moment. And just, just noting that a lot of people that we talk to because of partly because of the rumours that have been out there, believe that the government and the media as well haven't been truthful about you know the number of people who have passed away and that kind of thing. So, can you give us a, an update there on the latest? I, I can confirm that uh, as of this morning, the police have no additional bodies that they are trying to identify. So, no other known deaths that they're trying to contact the next of kin of as of this morning. Um, in terms of the the overall number, there's about a hundred. I think it was 151 um, that they're down to in terms of people who haven't been contacted. But it's an even smaller smaller number, um, I don't have a specific number, but it's a much smaller number um, in terms of people who were last seen in the flood affected areas. So we're saying less than 10, less than 20? Um, I, I don't have a specific number, but they, they've said that it's a smaller number than that in terms of people who were last seen in the flood affected areas. On your response to crime, just going back to that topic there, do you think perhaps you, you got the tone of your, of your response not quite right, kind of focusing on what level of crime was reported yeah. as opposed to empathising with what people yeah. were actually feeling? Look, look, I was trying to do both, uh, and if people took from, from one of the comments that I made any suggestion that I was diminishing the, um, the way they were feeling, uh, I certainly regret that. Um, I absolutely understand the level of stress that people in the community have been under. Um, my message to them is the police are here, the police are active, the police are visible. If something is happening that you're uncomfortable about, if there is criminal offending going on, please report it to the police. They are here and they will absolutely take action on it. And so they've taken matters into their own hands and a lot of communities, as you will have seen, community roadblocks. Thinking back to COVID, you know, we had those roadblocks and that was a long process to get that partnership working, but it seems like things have gone a lot smoother now. What do you see as the, the potential for, for these kind of future disasters where we can stand something like this up, where it's a community plus police plus army roadblock? Are, are you open to that? Uh, look, the key thing is to work with the police. Uh, look, I think in, in many cases when the police are stretched uh, they welcome the community's support and they can make sure that whatever's happening is happening safely. Um, that's the key thing. You know, keep the, keep the lines of communication open with the police. We see examples of this even when we're not at a disaster time. You know, we see community patrols who actually, you know, it can be the eyes and ears of the police and can, can be a really valuable supplement to that. So where people are passionate and want to volunteer and they want to help, just make sure that they're directing that through the police and that can be directed to the place where it can make the biggest difference. And can I take the first-hand accounts of some of these reports coming in? What sort of reports have you been informed about since you've been here? Uh, like I said, I've only been on the ground an hour or two now. I'm going to be on the ground for a while longer, including heading up to Wairoa. Um, so a lot of the reports that I have seen have either been coming from uh, the team here who are based here uh, or from the police and from the conversations that I've been having with them. Look, the, the, the police are reporting that there is a, a lot, uh, there is a greater degree of concern and anxiety within the community, but they are also reporting that any crime that is reported to them, they are following up on and they are confident that they will, um, as they do, um, hold those accountable. Hold those responsible accountable, I should say. I think what is asking is what 
uh, the nature of those yeah. crimes? Well, look, people have seen the nature of them and the reported in the media. Um, I'm, I'm not going to, I can't do the police's job for them. No, but you've had um, a conversation but, with them this morning. Yeah, and, and again, I'll, I'll let the police share that information. That's that's their job, not mine. Well, it's right. not yes. focus on the gang activity at this time. Stuart Nash came out and said they need to pull their head in. Is there more you can be doing on this? Look, the police are very active in the gang space at the moment. There's no room for the gangs to step in and exploit the situation in any way. Uh, and I fully expect and I know that the police will take a very dim view of that and they will come down hard on it if it happens. Do you fully support your minister's comments on the gangs? Look, I don't have any time for the gangs. Um, I would far rather that they found something useful to do with their lives. So have you been advised of, because this is, again, one of the rumours that we hear is that the gangs are, are uh, incorporated in the level of crime that we're seeing here. Have you been advised of how much uh, participation they have in uh, no, I, it, it's difficult to put a specific number on it. The police certainly reported in the early days some heightened degree of tension between the gangs. Um, they have also reported that in the last few days that seems to have quietened down a little bit. Um, but like I said, I don't have a lot of time for the gangs at all. Um, I would far rather that those people got on and did something useful and constructive with their time. Yes. The Philippines. Have you been advised whether the body of the New Zealander killed in the Philippines is on its way home and the killer has been caught? No, sorry, I haven't. What can you say to the family? Uh, look, obviously my sympathy is with the family. I don't have a, a recent update on the facts of that case, um, but clearly uh, in any of these situations it's incredibly distressing for the families. Just on Papua New Guinea and the, the captured pilot, what is the government's position on West Papua New our, our position has not changed on that matter and we certainly are not going to change our, our international foreign policy based on hostage taking. We've never done that in the past and we're not going to do that now. Um, I can't comment on the specifics of the individual case at the moment. Um, when, when it's an appropriate, when there's an appropriate opportunity to do that, um, that doesn't compromise any work that's been uh, undertaken there, then I'll do that. But at the moment I'm not in a position to provide further so comment on it. Just a civil defence question. Um, how much rain are you expecting over the next yeah. wee while? Uh, how's it going to affect operations? Advice to people out there looking at the rain radar and and, uh, and, it, and it bringing up. Some yeah, most definitely. Look, we're we're we've now gone to a orange warning, um, and we're expecting between 100 to 150 mils. But that is over a 48-hour period. It's not like um, the cyclone where we had all of that arrive and more um, over a very short period of time. We're doing a lot of work in terms of um, doing some planning around possible evacuations, and it's only possible evacuations. Uh, the regional council is doing a lot of work in terms of making sure that the stop banks um, are, are repaired, emergency repairs, um, and their telemetry system is back up and running. We'll have people boots on the ground overnight on Friday in particular. Friday is probably the worst day. Um, our advice to people is on Friday, if you can not travel around and, and stay at home, that would be advisable. But the key thing is that people actually need to take this seriously, um, keep up to date with the, uh, the weather reports. Um, and as you say, the rain radar is a great tool um, in getting onto that Met Service website. So, so that's where we're at at the moment. What are the areas of concern? You just say the possible ev evacuations. What, what areas have you got? Well, obviously, areas where the stop banks were breached um, during Gabriel. Um, and that's where the modelling has been done. At this, at this stage though, the Regional Council has advised us at the rain rates we're talking about, um, which spread over that 48 hour period, they're pretty confident that the, um, that the, the, river, the major rivers should be able to handle the water um, because it's around about four to six millimetres per hour at maximum. Um, so, but we, we're, not, we're, we're taking this seriously. Um, we're going to have people on the ground uh, during the evening and at night actually watching where those breaches are and if we need to we're preparing emergency mobile alerts um, and if we need to we will tell people they need to evacuate and the local councils are preparing their civil defence centres. Bridges, have you got any concerns about particular bridges at the moment? Uh, what impact this weather could have on them? There's a lot of slash okay? on those bridges. Yeah. yeah, I mean look we, we, we really are going to have to take what it comes. Um, again, forecasts, um, but we are, you know, as I said, doing some planning, getting some public messaging out there over the next day or so, uh, and we'll be keeping a real close eye on things overnight, on, particularly Sorry. on Friday. I suppose a more specific question would be, are there any bridges of concern where you were looking at going, there's a lot of slash there, if there's a, a bit of rain in that area, this one could go as well? 
Yeah, look, I, I don't have any specific information on specific bridges, but definitely our lifelines and critical, infa- infa- uh, critical infrastructure teams are looking at that sort of thing. Just one for Minister Nash um, on forestry again. On RNZ last week, you, you quoted some figures. You said 40% of the build up is forestry slash and 60% is native. Um, where are those numbers from? Uh, from evidence of those who'd been out there having a look at it. Look, the bottom line is it doesn't matter where it comes from, right? What this inquiry is going to look at is land use practices on highly erodible soils in Tairawhiti. It doesn't, and the forestry stuff doesn't matter if it's plantation forestry or production forestry, permanent forestry or indigenous forestry. What we are finding is there is a lot of wood ending up on our beaches, taking out our bridges, and it's unacceptable. So we need to look at how we best manage this to mitigate the risk of this sort of thing happening in the future. So I know you don't want to, you know, you don't want to speculate on what's going to come out of it, but how transformative do you want this inquiry to be? Well, first of all, I want the forest industry to take responsibility for their operations, and I know they've begun to do that, and I know that some of the companies have actually retired some of the forestry which was planted for production. They've moved that into permanent, or they said, we're just not going to harvest this. Um, but, you know, it has to address the issue that 10,000 people in Tairawhiti signed a petition about because they are really concerned about what is happening in the forests and on the beaches. So, you know, this is a high-powered team. We take this incredibly seriously, and the recommendations that come out of this uh, we will take very seriously as well. I suppose you a more specific you know, question would be, out of this inquiry, is it your aim that we will never see another bridge being taken out by slash again? Impossible to say that. Absolutely impossible to say that. If you say that um, you know the forestry company is going to take responsibility for it, do you trust them? So, look, the forestry companies know that they operate under a social licence. And keep in mind that forestry up the East Coast employs... Do they, do they know that yes, they do. And forestry, come, forestry and wood processing employs a lot of people up the East Coast. So this is a very important part of the economic framework of the East Coast of the North Island. So you know, you're not going to see a recommendation that says, A, there'll never be another tree planted, or B, we're going to stop harvesting all forestry. That is not going to be the case. What we will see, I suspect, but again, I don't want to preempt anything, is a series of recommendations around how we can better manage the land and the forestry slash that comes from harvesting operations on those highly erodible soils. But keep in mind, in some areas, forestry actually is the answer. It's just the type of forest, the type of management regime put in place on those specific soils. OK, well, the Prime Minister, yeah. last, last few questions yeah, and then we'll um, wrap up. Yeah. A couple from me. Um, what do you have to say to families who have to spend thousands of dollars to uh, get private helicopters to evacuate their family or to get in, whether it be food supplies or farm supplies, because the choppers that the government was coordinating, the army and, and the defence force was coordinating, were too busy to rescue uh, look, clearly we had a lot of choppers in the air in those first few days uh, and the local teams were coordinating with the military to make sure that we were getting them to the areas of greatest need first. Um, I absolutely acknowledge that there was the private sector effort contributing to the rescue response and to the uh, immediate need response as well um, and I thank them for that. So is the government going to pay them back? Because I mean, we heard from you just a couple of days ago, we heard that we had enough choppers on the ground. Clearly, if people are having to spend thousands of dollars to evacuate their kids, there aren't enough jobs. Yeah, look, it's not something that I have looked at at this point, but I'm happy to take it away and have a look at it. Different tech. Um, yeah. was question time yesterday? Uh, it's first question time for the year, um, and on balance it went OK. Um, I did make a mistake and one of my answers around tax has been pointed out by the, the opposition. Um, so, uh, you know, I'll own that. Um, in my first outing at Question Time I made a mistake. Um, but I'll, uh, I wasn't perhaps as well prepared for a pop quiz on the government's finances as I should have been. I'll make sure that I'm better prepared next time. So you're going to be brushing up on the numbers, eh? Uh, absolutely, yeah. Prime Minister, how confident are you in the communication lines between NEMA and local Well, NEMA have got people on the ground working with local civil defence agencies now, so I'm confident that that's leading to a good level of communication. Uh, obviously, in the first 24 to 48 hour period, uh, there are challenges there because the phone lines were out, the power was out, uh, and so on, but we got boots on the ground to work with the local teams as fast as we possibly could. Uh, and as a result, I'm, I'm confident that the communication channels are open and, and are working effectively. Well, yesterday, NEMA reported there were about 729 people in evacuation centres nationwide. I actually have the uh, the, the national um, uh, director from NEMA here. I'm I'm happy to defer that question to him.
Thank you, Prime Minister. Um, look, the, the numbers do move around a bit. Um, I'm standing next to, uh, you know, the group controller. We've got a significant number of uh, NEMA staff here, and have since the beginning of the ev of the event. Um, if there's some uh, variation in the um, uh, consistency of those numbers, happy to look into that and make sure that gets um, straightened out. Uh, it can depend a little bit, uh, you know, as to date stamp on the on the information that's being provided. But I'm uh, very confident uh, in the connection uh, and the relationship between NEMA and and uh, Hawke's Bay CDM Group. The USR um, head here in Hawke's Bay told me yesterday that they're working on a priority list of 40 people. Um, do you know about that and has that number reduced? Uh, look, I can't speak to USAR information in any detail. I think that's an operational matter for them. I'll, I'll let them lead that one out. Um, so just on businesses affected by yes. um, are you looking at a package to help businesses, something like So I, I haven't got anything further to announce today. Um, what you will have seen us announcing uh, earlier in the week was a two-pronged package. One was support through the local business associations um, that will be made available to businesses as quickly as possible. The other is uh, through the Ministry for Primary Industries, a support to our primary sector, our farmers, our, our growers, to make sure that they're getting support for the clean-up effort. Um, and we're trying to get that out the door as quickly as possible as well. Those are immediate responses, though. Um, as the extent of the damage and where it's where the damage is and the, the true kind of I guess need is better understood then we'll be able to shape up further response you know support based on that one of the things that we don't want to do is misdirect support to those who perhaps don't need it uh, and therefore not provide the, the, the degree of support that's required by those who really really do need it oh, the announcements we've made this this week are a start um, they're certainly not the end of the matter all right, thanks. About, you can get the last question. Okay. You've spoken about Build Back Better, and at the moment all our cabling for, for power and for telecommunications goes under bridges, which obviously in hindsight isn't the best way. What is the alternative to that? Well, and, and some of those bridges are quite old as well, so we have to acknowledge that. So I think one of the challenges we'll have ahead of us as a country, not just in the areas that have been affected here, but right the way across New Zealand, will be to look at the resilience of our infrastructure and how prepared we are to cope with these kind of events. And certainly the single point of failure that we have in a lot of small communities where their, their water, their telecommunications, their wastewater, uh, their power uh, and, and their main transport link all are on the same old bridge, uh, those are areas of concern for us that we're going to have to look at. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thanks.